Hey, greetings, class. We are uh, week eight. Um, this is lecture. Well, it's lecture one of week eight. I did give you the one lecture from week seven. Uh, I'm going to record a couple more here tonight. Um, so it'll be a total of four that you'll get to respond on Wednesday. Uh, they're, they're not, I mean, again, they're not anything huge or groundbreaking or anything like that. Um, but I did want to share just a few last thoughts, last minute thoughts. Uh, for us as we as we make our way through. Um, I've really enjoyed being in the class with you all. Um, I'm sorry if it felt like my attention was divided at times given that I was trying to complete a dissertation. Uh, we've uh, but I feel like we've we've made our way through and and things have been okay. Um, so uh, I'll be uh, grading tonight, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, trying to knock out a bunch of things. I've gotten some things back to you back already. Hopefully get you a bunch more here within the next a uh, couple days, and uh, so you'll know kind of where you're sitting by Friday. Um, and uh, I'm gonna do my work, do my best uh, to work on all of that uh, in the midst of trying to travel to Nashville and graduate. <laughs> so, uh, just wanted to, so today's lecture, this this particular lecture, I want to talk to you. So we've been talking about missional uh, missional missional posture. We've been talking about missional theology. And I, last lecture, I talked to you a little bit about exposure therapy, the kind of engagement with the other, uh, giving your congregation an opportunity to experience uh, missional life and missional living in ways that uh, can broaden their horizons. But I wanted to also speak about the three more things, really. Uh, the first of which is the idea of alterity or the difference, um, being different. So I think a missional, uh, a strong missional theology or stri strong uh, missional posture in the world recognizes the urgency and the imperative of cultivating a countercultural people, which means that a truly missional people don't fit the molds and the models that have been prescribed to us uh, through number of different um, identity forming uh, entities. For instance, let me let me use one for an example. Um, within the current cultural context. Of course, politics is playing a huge role in the uh, public discourse, right? And so um, there's this there's this conversation to be had, especially within the evangelical church, is are we primarily Republican or are we uh, Democrat? Um, and you'll you'll hear sort of a posturing by by influential Christians on both sides to suggest that one party is is more faithful or more true to the the message of Jesus. Uh, than the other, and so what? What you end up happening? What what ends up happening is that you have politically motivated uh, Christians who have their identity shaped by a party platform and agenda uh, before they do an understanding of the kingdom of God. And I think a true missional theology takes seriously the countercultural nature of Jesus. So in in the in the text of of the scriptures and the gospels particularly. Jesus uh, is has a way of avoiding uh, labels, right? So um, the 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 very conservative group, or the, what we would call the Pharisees, there were times in which it appeared that Jesus uh, was one of them, and they would want to embrace him. And then all of a sudden, he would do something that would challenge those assumptions. And then the Sadducees, which would have been in in our terminology, sort of the liberal. Uh, a group uh, within within that culture, um, they would say, "Okay, Jesus must be one of ours." And then all of a sudden, uh, Jesus would do something that that would throw them off as well. Jesus refused to be camped. He refused to be put into a camp, boxed in, and and identified or owned by any particular party. And and whether that's a religious party, whether that's a political party, whatever that is, um, I think we have to be careful that we so we don't so embed ourselves with a political platform that we that we miss the the necessity of cultivating a prophetic stance in this world. So I think part of part of what makes us um radically missional in this world is that we cultivate a prophetic sense, meaning we're willing to speak the will of God into the world and speak truth to power. Uh we, we don't we, we can't be camped very quickly. We take seriously the words of of Second Peter, so or excuse me, of First Peter. So when the when the when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were called to Mount Sinai, and there they were given an identity. They said, "You are holy nation, a royal priesthood, uh, that you are going to be a peculiar possession, a treasured possession of God." Uh, that language is then applied to the church in First Peter, and in that he also says that you ought to be aliens and strangers. And I think that to me uh, is is it's it's essential for us to understand 
that for us to be truly missional, we've got to cultivate in us this countercultural mindset where we are different, not for not just for different sake, but for to give witness. This is one of the most beautiful things that I think, even when we talked about missional hermeneutics and the way we understand the law. The law was not given for the law's sake. The law was given to shape a people who look differently, act differently, and, and, and were able to bear out a witness different than all of their surrounding neighbors. I think when the church takes that seriously, we may at times participate as citizens in this world through ideas of like democracy and voting and those types of things. However, we all we we do always with a tension, I think, that recognizes that no one political party is going to manifest the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God subverts all political parties and calls the powerful into account for the power that they've they've been afforded or given or the authority uh, that has been placed on their shoulders. And we have to to embody in this world an alternative to the power hungry mentalities that drive so much of the political discourse. So so one of, I think that's one of the things that made the early church so profoundly missional is that they lacked a sense of of uh, uh, political influence or power. They were the persecuted uh, persecuted minority, especially at first, and in that. They found themselves in the Roman Empire, a Roman Empire that didn't at first embrace them. They were they were saying things as, for instance, Christ is Lord, which that was an honorific title reserved for Caesar. And so that that in of itself, the kingdom of God becomes a political statement, not a political statement in the ways in which we are accustomed to making them, but a political statement in the sense that we follow a kingdom that has a Lord, and in that Lord, in that Lordship of Christ, it it, it shapes how we embody the virtues or the character of Christ in this world, both individually and especially corporately. And one of the well, there's a beautiful passage from the second half of the second century by a guy named Athenagoras. And um, he, he writes this, he's basically contending on behalf of the, the persecuted church against the pagans. And he's writing to a, uh, a, a person of power. Uh, basically asking them, why are you persecuting us? Uh, and then he writes this statement, and I've got to read it, read you to it in its entirety here. And yet who of them, and he's speaking of the pagans at this point, and yet who of them have so purified their own hearts as to love their enemies instead of hating them, instead of upbraiding those who first insult them, which is certainly more usual, to bless them, to pray for those who plot against them. On the contrary, they ever persist in delving into the evil mysteries of their sophistry, ever desirous of working some harm, making skill and oratory rather than proof of their deeds, their business. But with us, he says, on the contrary, you find unlettered people, tradesmen and old women, who though unable to express in the words the advantages of our teaching, demonstrates by the acts of the value of their principles. For they do not rehearse speeches, but evidence good deeds. When struck, they don't strike back. When robbed, they don't sue. To, to those who ask, they give, and they love their neighbors as themselves." And I think that's a beautiful uh, expression of the ways in which uh, our alterity, or our difference, our cult, our countercultural persona um, serves as a witness in the world. And in fact, many people in the early church came to faith not because of the preaching of the word first or primarily. That happened later. But they came to faith because of the witness of the community that exhibited and embodied something different in this world. And I think for us, as we begin to think about our posture in this world, we've got to think of it in terms of, of difference. Um, that when people come uh, wounded and weary out of some of those identity-forming machines of politics, of religiosity, of ethic, uh, excuse me, of ethnic origin, of racial, um, uh, of racial division, um, of of economic so, socioeconomic class structures, I think is we embody a different kind of people, and we embody that alterity, that difference. Um, and we do it well, I think that in of itself serves as a compelling evidence of what it means to say that we are Christ followers and that we have given ourselves to the mission of the kingdom. So just in our countercultural embodiment, we are fulfilling the Missio Dei. So I wanted to share that with you today. I think that's really important for us to keep in mind, especially as we move forward uh, in finishing up this course. Le the, the third lecture that you'll need to watch is coming up next.